This is Ikutaro Kakahashi. This image is taken from the front cover of his book, titled, I Believe in Music, written in 2002 in conjunction with the 30th anniversary of the company he founded, the Roland Corporation. Roland today is one of the largest producers of electronic music instruments, using various technologies to produce everything from synthesizers to electric organs and pianos to digital audio workstations and sample sound libraries. Kakahashi founded Roland in 1972 in Osaka, Japan, following a series of successful business endeavors in consumer electronics that began in the 1950s with Kakahashi, as a young man, repairing watches and clocks. His inquisitive and inventive spirit worked to his advantage during a period in post-war Japan where Western technology and infrastructure were entering the country's markets and brain trust. Along with Western technology to Japan came Western popular culture, specifically American. Contemporary American music was programmed on Japan's newly reopened public radio, and it was under the influence of this music, perhaps, that Kakahashi decided to channel his business and engineering efforts into the expansion of electronic music instruments. In speaking of Roland's work ethos, Mr. Kakahashi writes in his book, quote, it is important that the manufacturing side concentrate on providing useful devices to meet creative wishes. It is not the proper role of a manufacturer to demand that the artist perform totally new playing methods. That would merely be an attempt to exploit novelty devices that had been dreamed up by arrogant designers." Unquote. This is Tedao Kikumoto, currently the senior managing director of the Roland Corporation. During Roland's beginning years, he was a product engineer and in the early 1980s set out to work on a new bass instrument, one that could potentially offer an acceptable alternative to the widely popular electric bass, which was itself a semi-new instrument, having been invented in 1951 by Leo Fender for the Fender Musical Instruments Corporation. In 1982, Roland released Kikumoto's invention, the TB-303 bass line, to Western markets, having a retail price of about 400 U.S. dollars. Aimed at the pop music market, Roland hoped it would help offer musicians who did not have the means to hire or retain a bass player a chance to effectively incorporate bass lines into their composing process. Coupled with the already released Roland TR-606 Drumatics drum computer, which allowed users to create and automatically replay their own rhythm patterns, the 303 further helped point the way towards a populist emblem of the one-man, or virtual, band. Both the electric bass and the 303 relied on amplification to make sounds. In other words, you had to plug them into bass amplifiers to hear them make any noise. But that is where the similarities ended. The electric bass guitar design had its heritage in western stringed instruments, particularly the contrabass whereas the 303 had its roots in the control interface of the analog synthesizer. The electric guitar's controls usually consisted of four strings, although more could be incorporated, the neck with its frets, the tuning heads, and tone control and volume control knobs. The TB-303 also consisted of a tone knob, called filter cutoff, and a knob for volume adjustments. Beyond that, it included knobs for tuning, which could increase the octave range to 4, resonance, envelope modulation, decay, and accent. Further change to the timbre of the machine could be achieved by switching between two waveforms, sawtooth or sine wave. Certainly, it seemed the 303 offered a wide variety of flexibility and control in shaping bass sounds. One played the 303 not through any strings, but via a pseudo-keyboard that consisted of buttons on its front that ran across a one-octave range. The buttons also doubled in duty as storage banks, with each one being able to keep a baseline pattern in memory. The 303 could create, but also record and play back, a chain of patterns to form an overall baseline composition. In spite of the 303 being a bit unorthodox when compared to a guitar-type instrument, Roland, perhaps with great confidence in their new product, or perhaps with desire to move product so as to quickly recoup initial production costs, shipped the 303 to Western markets without an English instruction manual. When English manuals did become available, 
Its first pages introduced the instrument with the following paragraph. Quote, F. How to use this manual. The switches and control knobs have several functions, so operating the TB303 may seem a little complicated. You may find difficulty using the TB303 at first, because it is so different from a bass guitar or keyboard instrument. Therefore, this manual includes a basic, intermediate, and advanced course to help you understand these operations step by step. However, each individual operation is quite simple, so take your time and master each step." Unquote. After reading the 90-page manual and familiarizing oneself with the operation of the 303, one could begin to coax bass lines out of the silver, battery-powered box. This is Craig Johnson, who lives in Southern California. In 1982, Craig purchased a TB-303. In correspondence recently written to this author, he goes on to state, quote, I'm a songwriter number one, and my initial intention was to make demos and ultimately do so from my own privately built studio. As you already know, a bass is a key ingredient to most ensembles, and I knew I needed that ingredient for my demos. Seeing as how I'm a guitar player, I felt it would be a fairly simple transition to an electric bass and was considering buying one. But, when the 303 came out, I went in that direction because I felt I wouldn't need to invest the practice time. I loved the flexibility of the 303 and thought that I could make it sound somewhat human, but with that comes a higher learning curve and more creative capabilities, both of which equate to increased time. I probably invested not more than 24 hours total time into the 303. All in all, I didn't have the time to invest, and what demos I did, I reluctantly paid alternative studios to do." Unquote. In 1984, two years after Roland released the TB-303 baseline, production of it stopped, with about 20,000 units being manufactured. That the 303 did not succeed in a 1984 music market is not to suggest that one couldn't get a decent electric bass type sound from the machine when programmed according to Roland's instruction manual. There were, for example, some early 80s UK recording acts who released pop tracks with 303 made bass lines using Roland's offered methods. So it wasn't so much that the 303 had timbral shortcomings, as much as it seemed to lack easy pattern and improvisation flexibility. Put simply, it was hard to play. A composer would have to invest serious time in tedious programming to attain a type of pattern structure that could be more quickly realized using traditional bass guitar approaches. But what type of music suited the 303, if any? Perhaps, if we point to a track from early 80s electro and breakdance culture, We'll hear an instance where raising the 303's octave range up and programming just one pattern repeatedly, in other words, playing the 303 not according to any accepted convention, provided a musical expression different from the usual lower octave baseline structure of other pop music. Here, the Brooklyn artist Nucleus, with their 1984 track Jam On It, used a higher pitched, fluttering type of 303 sound to accompany the lower non 303 baseline hook. Around the same time period, as TB-303 units went for cheap through secondhand channels due to their scant popularity and success in most mainstream music, 
other musicians experimenting with new sounds began using them. After breakdance music had peaked in the U.S., club culture continued use of the 303. Chicago musicians Earl Smith and Nathaniel Jones, who recorded under the moniker Future, took to tweaking more than just the pitch knob on the box. By manipulating all six knobs on the front of the 303, they drove it farther away from traditional bassline sounds and into a squelching, alien territory. This sound ultimately grew into what is known today as Acid House. The Acid House sound would soon travel across the ocean to the UK, where grassroots ecstasy and rave culture was exploding, culminating in 1988's so-called Summer of Love parties throughout the kingdom's warehouses and countrysides. Here are the UK's 808 state, with their acid track, Flow Coma, released in 1988. Notice the multi-layering of 303 patterns. Other artists who rose to prominence during the UK's rave movement would lift the music's trademark 303 sound out of the underground and into the pop charts. Here are the merry pranksters Jim Cotty and Bill Drummond, aka the KLF, with their house crossover anthem, What Time Is Love, which reached into the top five of the UK pop charts around its release in 1990. Slowly but surely, these new, so-called, bass lines, created by 303 knob twiddling, emerged to become staple ingredients in both pop and alternative slash experimental music, equally in the US and abroad. By the early 1990s, electronic music was well underway in its multiplying and hybridizing of forms, producing vast numbers of new music genres and subgenres. The pace of experimentation, especially aided by cheap little boxes like the 303, was matched only by a rigor to sort the sonic experiments into digestible categories. Minimal techno, loungy abstract jazz and hip hop, Intelligent Dance Music, or IDM for short. And Detroit Electro Bass, to name just a few. At times, all used the TB303 sound as a fundamental baseline ingredient. Noticing an increase in the incorporation of the 303 sound in popular music of all types, Roland, in order perhaps to exploit the growing hip factor of the box, released a sort of updated version of it in 1996, named the MC-303 Groove Box. This machine, slightly larger than the original 303 and packed with all sorts of capabilities particularly suited for contemporary dance music, was a hit on the market, selling 50,000 units in less than two years. The groove box was quite popular among producers who had never had access to an original TB303 and who didn't mind Roland's decision to use TB303 samples instead of its actual original circuitry as the sound engine for the MC303. Purists scoffed at the new machine, preferring the retro analog superiority of the 1984 version 303. Indeed, the sort of cult appeal of the 303 grew steadily from the late 1980s onwards to the extent that the discontinued machine's value eventually increased beyond the point of affordability for many of the bedroom studio musicians who helped to mythologize it in the first place. The 303's fetishization reached great proportions through 1997 and into 1998, during a time when the UK's Prodigy, whose abrasive and distorted 303-laden album The Fat of the Land, on Madonna's recording label Maverick, reached number one both in the US and the UK pop charts upon release. Not 
Not even Madonna herself was immune to the effects of the Vogue TB303 sound. Here the machine can be heard playing a simple 16th note repeating phrase in her track, Ray of Light, released in 1998. Also released in the years 1997 and 98, in addition to a growing number of 303 tracks, was computer software, which sought to emulate the Roland machine at a more affordable price. The product Rebirth, released by Sweden's Propellerhead Software, used algorithms modeled after the physical circuitry of the 303 in order to mimic its distinct sound. The software was priced at around 200 US dollars, far cheaper than a used TB303, which, depending on its condition, could sell in upwards of $1,000. It is interesting to note that in addition to recreating the sound of the 303 digitally, the engineers who programmed Rebirth also sought to emulate the control surface of the machine, on screen. These virtual knobs and buttons were initially controlled via the computer mouse or trackpad. Some would contend that this made for somewhat cumbersome interaction with the software on the part of the user, with the result that music component manufacturers developed all-purpose fader boxes with physical buttons and knobs to control programs like Rebirth. So today, we have computer software consisting of representations of a three-dimensional interface on a two-dimensional screen being controlled by third-party hardware so as to emulate the sound of a machine built 20 years ago, which was itself built to emulate the sound of a machine built 30 years before it. That the rich history of the 303, and the ways it spawned further cultural and technological experimentation, would have occurred at all, had Roland's so-called arrogant designers succeeded in producing a viable baseline instrument circa 1984, remains to be seen. Finally, perusing Roland's promotional literature, in particular the section about the history of their instruments, the following passage is found, quote, 1980-1981, TR-808 Programmable Rhythm Machine, TB-303 Baseline, a groundbreaking rhythm machine that used microcomputer chips which allowed the user to program a song's rhythm patterns. Along with the TB-303, the TR-808 still maintains considerable popularity among musicians and studios, unquote.